So why do you think it's called a red tide? Wild guess, come on. Because it's red. Because it's red, <laughs> exactly. And it's red, you can visibly see it. So the water changes from its normal clear blue color to red because of this accumulation of a red algae. So what causes algal blooms? Well, in general, it indicates that something's wrong with the system. And if um, algae are plants, what do plants need to grow? Sunlight. Water, sunlight. So these are aquatic plants, so they've got the water. Sunlight, what else? Anyone ever grow plants or have a lawn? What do you add? Fertilizer. Fertilizer, exactly. They need nutrients. They need food. And then they also have these interactions in the biological community. So because they're the basis of the food web, sometimes they get eaten. They're important criteria. So whenever there are some substantial shifts to any of the above criteria, it can be an indication or it can make an algal bloom occur. <clears throat> so what's the big deal? Well, how many of you have ever heard of harmful algal blooms? Not all algal blooms can be harmful, but some are. And this occurs whenever that there's an impairment due to this excessive accumulation of algae. And there can be some pretty substantial issues to a water system as a result of these algal blooms. So in terms of ecological concerns, you can have low dissolved oxygen. Why would low dissolved oxygen be bad? What do living things need to breathe? Oxygen, exactly. So imagine what would happen to a system when you have low dissolved oxygen. Things are gonna start to get really stressed. They're gonna start to move away from the area that they're living. If they can't move, if they're an organism that's attached to something or attached to the bottom, then what's likely to happen? They're die. Exactly. Now here's a question for you. If algae are plants and plants photosynthesize and create oxygen, how could it bloom a massive occurrence of these plant-like organisms? How could that cause low dissolved oxygen? It's a little counterintuitive, isn't it? Anyone want to take a guess? So what were some of the other things that plants need to survive? Well, they may have like less nutrients than they need. Not less nutrients, but some less sunlight. Exactly. It's such a rapid accumulation of these algae that they start to smother each other out. And they're no longer getting light. And so as they decay and as they die and as they settle out, all that decay is resulting in low dissolved oxygen because the bacterial breakdown, the natural decaying process of all that plant matter results in low dissolved oxygen situations. There's also food web disruption. So like I said, they're at the basis of the food web. So if you have this massive accumulation of something at the base, it's gonna stress the organisms out especially if you have organisms that are moving out of the system because they're stressed from low dissolved oxygen. So if you have the smaller fish and um, your other plants are dying because there's no oxygen, well then what's gonna happen? It's gonna create a lot of cascading shifts in the food web and the whole system's gonna turn out of whack. There are economic concerns. So like I said, there's colors disruptions, um, over here on the bottom, I say taste and odor disruption. Some of them, they actually have a physical um, smell to them. It's pretty unpleasant. Whenever you think of decaying plant matter, it's not a nice smell. And so, do you want to go recreate on the beach when there's stinky algae and it's a funky color? Do you really want to be swimming in it? Do you necessarily want to be laying out on the beach? No, no. no right? So people come to South Florida, they come to Miami because of our beaches, because of our water. So you can imagine some of the economic uh, issues that can have. Also, in addition to recreational revenue, fishing. A lot of people come here not just for our beaches, but to go boating and fishing. So you can imagine the effects that it's gonna have in terms of the problem. And then public health concerns. 
So, so a harmful algal blooms can actually have cause respiratory um, issues for humans and animals. So a lot of times people take their dogs out for walks on the beach. The breathing of these harmful algal blooms can actually cause respiratory issues to some people. And there are allergic, um, allergic reactions that can happen. And then toxicity. So this is a, can be a concern if you're consuming things that are in the water at the time of the algae blooms. So because of the food chain, those algae are going to be taken up into things like mussels and oysters and smaller fish. And especially the cyanobacteria, that can have resultant toxicity effects to other organisms, like you can see here those fish kills. So what's the harm? Um, you know, it's unpleasant. You probably don't want to go swimming in it. It might make your throat itch a little, but, but really what's the harm? Why are we calling them harmful algal blooms? And it's because it accumulates in these fish and shellfish over time and it can cause serious long-term disruptions. Um, recreational exposure, so you can actually get these more toxic impacts. The picture of the fish kills from the earlier slide, you can have die out or animals leave the system completely. And then you have just in general environmental degradation and habitat alteration. So if you look at this picture, this is actually a local picture of some of our coral species that are being completely smothered by a macroalgae. So our natural you know, coral and sponges and soft corals and seagrasses can be smothered out and outcompeted by these algae species. So what does that mean for us here? Well, over the past decade, we've seen and experienced um, a number of algal blooms which have sort of been unprecedented. So in 2005, 2008, that's the color blue, in two different regions of the bay, here in South Biscayne Bay and in the Card Sound Bard Sound area. And then um, we saw a blue-green algae, which again is that cyanobacteria. Again in 2008, and persisting a little bit today, in the Coral Gables Waterway area up there in the green, there's a macroalgae, which remember this is a larger algae species which are on the bottom. So they're not going to discolor the water, but they're present on the bottom like a seaweed would be. And then in 2013, the last one was our biggest. And this one was really unique in that it was offshore, and it was a diatom bloom. <coughs> so here's a picture of the first algal bloom that we had. This was in 2005, 2008. It was a long algal bloom that we had. And it's thought that the cause of this, because it was in the southern part, right around the same time that the construction was happening along US-1 down to the Keys. And so as they were clearing that to build the roads, and as they were clearing the mangroves, all of that was washing into the bay. So they think the result of all of that excess sediments and nutrients into the system was the cause of this bloom. And you can see here, you know, this is a healthy seagrass. This is the exact same picture. I don't know if um, you can actually see it here. But the way scuba divers go out and assess damage is they have what they call transects. So it's a meter by meter long square, which you can see this PVC plastic thing here. And they assess what's in that transect. This is the same location, and this is the transect. I don't know if you can see the lines. But you can see the disastrous visibility. They can't even essentially see the transect that's right in front of their face. This is the persistent macroalgal bloom. And again, this is slightly different in that um, it's not in the water column. So it's not going to change the water clarity. It's not going to make it a different color. You're not going to smell it. But you can see, again, we have healthy seagrass beds. And why is it, anyone know why seagrass beds are important? Yeah. Don't like the turtles like hatch? I mean, not the hatch there, but the girls. Uh, it's a nursery habitat for a number of important species to our area. Yeah. Um, like 
animals like manatees eat the grass? Exactly. Manatees and sea turtles eat the grass. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah, in the back. I'm kind of guessing maybe they keep the sand down. Absolutely. That's a huge one. They stabilize the sediment. It's really important for us here. And then another one that most people don't think about because it's just sort of like a low grass, but they actually act as like a wave buffer when we have strong storms and waves. It's sort of that, you know, a buffer from, and it sort of dilutes the wave action that's going to come onto shore and hit us. So it sort of helps breaker that. So it's pretty important to have these healthy seagrass communities, which is why we take notice when these macroalgal events are happening. And as a result, we've lost thousands of acres of seagrass in this area. And it's much diminished, but it is persistent still. And the last one was in 2013. And this was a diatom bloom, which is another type of algae. Diatoms have, they're kind of cool, they have like a little silica shell to them. Um, you could see, again, here's a picture, that first picture of the transect um, obviously not the same location, but here's the transect here. So you can see what the water clarity was like. And the reason why this one was so different was because it was offshore. Now, one of the big indicators or one of the big um, sort of causes of algal blooms in general is excess nutrients. And a lot of times those nutrients come from the land. Now because this was offshore and wasn't right next to shore, it completely baffled everyone as to what was going on. Normally the first thing that you can link to is, okay, something happened on land that caused these excess nutrients to go into the system. That wasn't the case with this one. It was completely different. The other thing that you'll note was that for each of these three events, they were in different areas. They were also different species, which indicates that there's a lot more going on in the system. It's not just, let's say, cyanobacteria are wreaking havoc in this same bay. There's a lot of different species that are taking advantage of sort of abnormal conditions. And essentially, after the 2013 algal bloom, a group of resource managers and scientists who study water quality in Biscayne Bay got together and said, look, something's going on here. In the last 10 years, we've had three significant long-term algal bloom events. And this is pretty unprecedented. We don't have a history of algal bloom events in Biscayne Bay. Normally, when you think of the bay, historically, it's crystal clear blue waters. And the fact that we're having them over long periods of time, three years plus, and different species and in different areas, suggests that Biscayne Bay is reaching a tipping point where it's no longer able to naturally rebound from stressors that are normal to a system. When we got in the room, we also realized that no one knew about this. No one had any idea that algal blooms were becoming a problem, that they were becoming more frequent. And as anyone knows, the only way to sort of raise awareness about an issue is to have people know and care about it. So the county does have a long-term water monitoring program. That's how we knew these things were going on. That's how we knew abnormal you know, occurrences were happening. They were able to monitor trends over time. And at exactly the same time that we were sort of meeting in this room to say, what are we going to do about this, the South Florida Water Management District who is the funding source and responsible for the Biscayne Bay Water Quality um, Monitoring Network, reduced funding for that program by 47%. So we lost, you can see this map here is historically all of the sites that the county <coughs> and FIU collaboratively used to monitor together. Those sites in red were cut. And they were strategically, you know, I mean the county recognized that they still needed a robust system. They still needed a robust monitoring program. So they strategically picked sites that would leave an existing program in place that would cover, you know, the whole <coughs> bay. But they had to remove about 25 sites or so from their program. 
And so what we decided, myself being Florida Sea Grants Extension, is this is a perfect outreach and education program. And so we created Biscayne Bay Water Watch, which is a citizen science water monitoring program. So how many of you know what citizen science is? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know I'd have to answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> is heavily involved in citizen science, so someone's got to be able to give me an Actually, answer. Actually, I'll give you some. Okay. Citizen Scientist was a, um, a project created by, the, by a group of collaborators, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, University of Miami Rosenstiel School, and, um, and, the Knight and the Knight Foundation. And it was funded by the Knight Foundation. The idea was to bring community awareness and engagement in these type of uh, in our natural resources and issues, environmental issues that we are facing. Exactly. So that's the perfect example of what Key Biscayne Citizen Science Project is doing. Citizen Science in general is involving just that regular citizens, non-scientists, to participate and actively involve themselves in scientific research. And so we're doing that with the Biscayne Bay Water Monitoring Program in getting regular citizens who have a passion or concern or just want to participate in something to help monitor water quality in Biscayne Bay. And what we're doing that's really unique, unlike other citizen science projects, is that we are actually adopting the exact same sites that were cut by the state's funding so that we can continue the, albeit in a much reduced capacity, but so we can continue having that baseline data that's necessary. Whenever you talk about data trends in water, you need to have long-term information to be able to detect when things are awry. So having, you know, oh, I really want to go in my backyard and pick a water sample, that's understandable because it's something that's important to you. But having that single point in time isn't gonna mean anything to the water managers. So by us being able to continue this 20 year long data set at the exact same locations, it's really impactful. And we are thereby giving all of our data to the water managers to use as they assess the health of the system. So what is it? Like I said, it's involving regular citizens. And because we wanted to address this as an outreach project, so outreach is just as you would expect, it's educating and reaching out to the community. And when you have 24 sites or 25 sites that you have to adopt, in terms of getting an educational message out, is it really appropriate for me to just be talking to 25 people who are gonna be adopting you know, sites? Not so much. There's 2.6 million people in Miami. 25 individuals isn't going to be reaching out. So the way we address this is by going to community organizations that have a stake and have a presence on Biscayne Bay and the surrounding waters, like the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. So it's a fantastic way to maximize our outreach and just get people to understand and know about these issues and then also recruit volunteers for the project. So what do we have them do? Volunteers have to have a boat, because you can, as you saw from the map, they're all sort of mid-bay, in the bay um, sites. They're not just along the shore. And they collect <coughs> temperature, pH, salinity, and dissolved oxygen right there on the boat the day of. They also collect water samples, which um, are brought to a lab right now at NOAA that get analyzed for nutrients. Why do we care about nutrients? It affects the plant growth. Exactly, it affects the plant growth. So usually you'll see an increase in nutrients first and then you'll see um, an algal bloom after. So we have to know what, nu what nutrients are in the water to see whether or not that's actually a cause and effect. And then we also have them take water samples which they themselves filter to, uh, so that someone in the lab can measure the amount of chlorophyll. 
And do you guys remember what chlorophyll is? Yes. yes. Yeah. What is it? It's what? It's what? It's, what? it's a substance. <laughs> exactly. It's a pigment that all algae have. It's what they use to photosynthesize. And so the researchers use the cell counts of chlorophyll to determine how much algae is in the system. It gives them essentially a count to know what normal levels are and what abnormal levels are. So this is um, our status as of today. I'm happy to announce that Biscayne Bay, because of the issues with the algal blooms, was recognized by NOAA as a habitat focus area, which means in 2015, they had a specific pot of money uh, for competitive grants that were designated solely <coughs> for Biscayne Bay. And I'm part of a team including Miami water keepers and uh, researchers at the University of Miami that got awarded that. And a lot of that money is going to help us expand this project. So today we have 11 sites that are being monitored of the 25, which is fantastic. Um, and we're looking to expand that because we just received these funds. So you can see right here, uh, the red sites are ones that are currently adopted and are being actively monitored by volunteers. And then the green ones are uh, sites that are still being, that still need to be adopted. And you can see our current list of volunteers right here. So temperature, pH, and salinity, I'm not gonna go into this in a whole lot of detail, but essentially they um, are indicators of normal, healthy systems. Temperature, as you can see in this little diagram, pretty much determines every other chemical and physical parameter in the marine environment that you can imagine. So monitoring temperature provides you a baseline for everything else that's going on. Uh, pH, for those of you who might be familiar with ocean acidification, has anyone heard of the term? Okay, well, shifts in pH, whether it's more basic or more acidic than what it should be, can cause uh, severe harm to the organisms that are living there and can cause mortality. And then lastly, salinity, whether it's fresh water, whether it's salty, um, whether it's somewhere in between, which is known as brackish water, that's essentially gonna determine what is living there and whether or not it can live in the system because freshwater species <coughs> can't live in salt water and vice versa, and so, that whole realm in between of the salinity of the water or the saltiness of the water is gonna tell you what organisms are likely to live there. Dissolved oxygen, we mentioned before, why is dissolved oxygen important? Come on guys, oxygen. I want someone else. Someone in the back. Red sweatshirt with the camera. Dissolved oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> But why do you need oxygen? To breathe. to breathe, exactly. And that's why we want to monitor oxygen. <laughs> because everything that's living in the water needs oxygen to survive. And so by testing that, we can tell whether or not there are healthy levels of oxygen in the water, whether there are low, stressful levels, which is called hypoxia, or whether there are no levels of oxygen, that's called anoxia. And essentially, when there's stress levels, organisms are going to start to leave the system. When there are no levels or when it's anoxic, things are going to start to die. And you can see here, this is sort of a graph of what the requirements are for, um, from, uh, for dissolved oxygen. One being very low, 14 being high. Nutrients. We already talked about nutrients, why they're important. They're critical for plant growth, but they also increases in nutrients can also indicate and trigger an algal bloom. Chlorophyll A, we discussed that and I just wanted to show you these pictures. This is actually what our volunteers use. It's pretty simple filtration. You just sort of hand, pipe, hand pump it, they collect it on a filter, and then someone in the lab will actually go out and count that. And by being able to compare the amount of algae in a known quantity of water, at any time you can be able to compare algal cells over time. So what are the requirements and expectations for my volunteers? 
Well, first I mentioned that they have to have access to a boat because all of our water watch stations are boat accessible. We expect a minimum of one year commitment to um, actually adopting a site and monitoring it. <coughs> and monitoring is done monthly on the first full week of every month. So if, like let's say here, the first is on the Friday, that first week doesn't count. The first monitoring week is starts from here. And because we have volunteers, many of which who work full time, we buffer it with the two weekends on either end. And the reason why we do this is because there are still um, long-term monitoring programs that are done by the federal and county government and we want to be able to collect data at the exact same time that they do it. So all of the local water monitoring programs collect data at the exact same time. And this way they're comparable to one another. Because anyone who's been out on the water will know that not only weather, but currents and tides and all that can change. And that can affect the different chemistry and physical parameters of the water. So we want to be able to combine that in some way. Um, all the volunteers have to go through a training with me so that they know what they're doing. Um, and then they have to have access to a freezer because the samples for the nutrients and the samples that get filtered for chlorophyll, those are temperature sensitive. So they get kept in a freezer until they can coordinate with me and we pick them up and then I will drop off replacement side, uh, replacements for the next month. So what if participants receive? They get all the equipment, a training book, data sheets, laminated reference card that's all the boring stuff in order for them to be able to do the actual sampling. They get program updates, fact sheets, they actually get the data themselves, and then we're also doing um, vol volunteer meet and greets so that the volunteers who are participating in the program can actually meet and sort of discuss with one another. So I'm going to show you a little bit um, what our website looks like and what the data looks like that all our volunteers are collecting. Hopefully this will work. Okay, so <laughs> what you see here is a map of the site, both currently adopted and not adopted as we discussed before. And I'm going at this a little backwards, so it's weird for me. But um, here we go, we'll do a site right here off of Key Biscayne. This one is monitored by um, the Key Biscayne Yacht Club. Anyone know sailing director Adrian there? <laughs> She's my volunteer. She's a rock star. She's awesome at this. And she's sort of a prime example. Um, she doesn't have a science background at all. She was super worried about doing this. And she sort of picked it up and fell in love with it. And so you don't need to have a science background or need to have lab experience to be able to do these uh, sampling. Okay, so when we select, click on our sites, you can see the long-term data. This is really weird to do. There we go. So we have salinity, pH, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll. So you can see that there was a little spike there, but not a whole lot. And that's why it's really important to have long-term data trends, because you need to know what's happening over the time, and on average, what are normal occurrences. If you look at this at a one time, you would say, OK, maybe that's something that we need to be concerned of, because it looks like a spike. But when you compare it over time, it's completely within the realm of what's normal for this area. And then for each of the sites, you can go and you can see the individual months that things have been collected as well as all of the data in larger forms. So you guys have ownership of the data. This is your data as citizens. It's not my data. Um, it's everyone in this room. It's the community because it's a community science water monitoring program. So anyone can access this data and take a look at it. And the other good thing about this, and you know, so one thing I want to note is that 
The purpose of this is not for us to be analyzing the data. The purpose of this is for us to be collecting the data, giving it to the resource manager so that they can add it to their database and continue to do what they do in terms of assessing the status and health of Biscayne Bay in hopes that, you know, my hope and goal for this project is that it's a short-term project and that the state will get its act together and refund the water monitoring for Biscayne Bay, recognizing that you know, the citizens care about it, but that we need more. What we're doing here is sort of the baseline data necessary to check health and status in terms of algal blooms, but there's much more data that you know, the county does on a monthly basis that we as volunteers just aren't equipped to do. So I'm hoping that through this process, by raising awareness, that we can sort of get back what we've lost in terms of what our original <coughs> monitoring program was. And with that, it didn't work. But anyway, I'll take questions. <laughs> so I want to thank you for having me here and learn about me. what can I do to make a difference? And living on a barrier island, I think, as you mentioned, we we're, we're very have a very personal relationship with the sea. Um, and so you might notice, like, on Cuba's game, all the drains say, all drains lead to the sea. Mm -hmm. So that means there's things that we definitely shouldn't be putting in the into the drains, right? And I'm Absolutely. thinking, for example, mostly detergents and fertilizers, because as you mentioned, fertilizers contain nitrogen that uh, exacerbates issues like, like the blooms, the algae blooms. So I know, for example, when we talk about fertilizer, it's what you maybe use for your, for your lawns to try to keep them green, right? And so maybe everyone with a home um, can start thinking differently about maybe not having grass but different types of plants that don't require fertilizer, as well as your everyday laundry detergent that doesn't contain phosphates. Um, because I think you'll see in the supermarket now, there's a lot of detergents that say phosphate free. They might cost a little bit more, but again, we have a very close relationship with the effects of what we put down the drain and how it affects our ocean, what we swim in, what we, the food that we eat and the recreation that we enjoy from the sea. Exactly. And there are entire programs, like the Extension Florida Yards and Neighborhoods program, is designed with the sole purpose of sort of promoting Florida-friendly landscaping, which are native plants that don't require excessive watering, which is actually also a burden on this game bay, or these excessive nutrient inputs because they're local native plants. They're meant to be grown here, and they obviously have selected plants which look good in a yard. You know, they're not just arbitrary plants. And there's not to say that there's not a space for a grass yard. People like their grass yard, and I 100% get that and respect that. But grass yards don't need this overabundance. People tend to think that they need to chuck fertilizers on it to keep them healthy. If there's a little browning, people throw fertilizers. So it's just looking at things and being a little bit more responsible in terms of the day-to-day -day activities that we all do, recognizing that our inputs, you know, our outputs have an input into the bag. Yeah. So is there any connection with the water treatment plant with any of these algal blooms? Not that they've been able to tie it to, no. I mean, you know, in the area, the treatment plant here, the landfill down at Black Point, you know, those are always concerns. But in terms, and I'm not going to say that they haven't had impacts on the water quality in general, but not related to the algal blooms. So, and that could just be another one of those triggers in terms of, and, and I'm sort of just throwing this out there in general, that Biscayne Bay is having so many more inputs from things like our sewage outfalls and the landfills and stuff that it's no longer able to naturally balance itself out. Yes? 
Um, for those three blooms that you talked about, the blue and the green and the red, um, were there any, um, not conclusive, but indicators of what were the causes during those times that you could talk so to So the us very about? first one, the, o, the 0508, um, is the one that they, they think, because it coincided with the construction of uh, what was happening down at US-1, they think right. there was the construction right. and the, essentially the defoliation and deforestation of all the mangroves, that that was the cause there. There's, there's thoughts that the, and I'm not actually sure if they've conclusively, you know, figured this out, but the Coral Gables waterway um, is a high septic area. So there's thoughts that that could be the cause of the macroalgae. They're actually doing tests now. It's pretty cool what they're able to do. They're able to test for um, things like artificial sweeteners in water because they don't break down. It's a little scary if you think about that. But it also directly ties back to human input. So we know if they're finding an artificial sweetener in Biscayne Bay that it's coming from sewage. So they're, they're doing those tests now. And then the diatom bloom, they really, at this point, they don't know. They're trying to assess. Yeah. Yes. After collecting all these uh, data, what is the next step? In other words, is any specific action or entity that is going to take action in order to improve if there is something that needs to be improved or put in place uh, uh, some sort of regulation to uh, control the, these problems? Well, the county oh, it has a very strong, very robust water uh, monitoring program, and it's the the commission that's responsible for sort of looking at the county level, at the county level looking at um, what needs to be done in terms of that. Do you report to them? I don't report to them. No, I mean you. Uh, this, uh, the, yes, the county, so the county water monitoring who have this data, they report back to the commission. I would say already the federal government is recognizing this and the fact that they established Biscayne Bay as a habitat focus area, which means they've already diverted federal funds specifically to Biscayne Bay. Um, so not only our grant and our project, which is doing not only Biscayne Bay Water Watch, but we're doing an economic assessment of Biscayne Bay, we're doing a geographic spatial system, um, we're trying to figure out nutrient inputs, it's a much larger scale, but NOAA scientists and researchers have also been diverted federal funds to specifically look at issues regarding um, water quality in Biscayne Bay. So federally and locally, I would say things are already being done and it's being recognized. It's the state level, um, who, which was the initial funding source for the water monitoring network that we need to work on. Any other questions? Yes? Does this like affect like, like the habitat, like the everglades and stuff like that? Not so much the Everglades because, so we're talking about marine environments, whereas the Everglades is more upland environments. Um, but it does affect the habitat that's in the marine environment. So we have the seagrasses, which I mentioned before. We have coral reefs. We have sponges. So all of that habitat and environment is definitely impacted. Is there anything that would keep an ambitious student from who needs to do a science project from doing double duty with their data? Could they do report this to you and then use the data for their science project? Uh, no, I mean this data as well as the water management, uh, you know, the long-term <laughs> data. That's all publicly available, so Ooh. people have access to that and can do with it what they will. <laughs> yep. Any other questions? Yes? Is this a problem like all around the world? Like algae blooms? Um, yeah, so algal blooms do occur all around the world. Um, they, there was a big, you know, algal bloom that was happening in Cal off the coast of California not too long ago that shut down some commercial fisheries. In Florida, as mentioned earlier, red tides, which don't happen on the Atlantic coast so much, but they're pretty frequent. Um, and they're naturally occurring. So sometimes algal blooms can be naturally occurring. It's just part of the system. 
So red tides are a naturally occurring algal bloom that um, happens fairly regularly but can have some serious impacts. They're harmful algal blooms. I don't know, any of you are familiar with the Indian River Lagoon? So you mentioned the Everglades. So Indian River Lagoon and on the west coast near Charlotte Harbor, um, how many of you guys have heard of Lake Okeechobee? Okay, so um, how many of you guys know that all of the canal system that we have here, it's all connected to Lake Okeechobee? Okay, and what happened, we had a lot of rain this past month, right? Yes. And so all of that water sort of gets stored in Lake Okeechobee. What happens if it's going to flood? Any idea? It goes to the bays, but it doesn't go naturally. We have all of these canals and this whole built system to divert water away from our agricultural <coughs> lands just south of Lake Okeechobee. And so they get diverted by a system of canals out to the west and out to the east. And so the west and the east have had some serious impacts of algal blooms and water quality because of this unnaturally diverted water from Lake Okeechobee. And this yes. is that water is also getting a lot of the runoff from the sugar cane? Or no? no, because it's before it actually hits the sugar cane. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't think it's actually been tested, you know, I don't, they're looking into it, let's just say it's a bit controversial, but ha I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the, the issues that Florida Bay is having right now. A lot of that is from runoff out of the Everglades, and that's thought to have nutrients from, from the sugar cane. Does it have to do with anything with greenhouse gas emissions? Not so much, no. I mean, I think as with anything in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, it's an added stress. So when you have a, a stressed system and then you're adding more stressors on top of it, that's when you start to have sort of system collapse. But directly related, no, this isn't directly related. So I want to ask the students a question. Did you guys learn anything today? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, three people. What was a new fact that you learned today? Someone from the back of the room. How about you in the black hat, black sweatshirt? With our okay, that Lake Okeechobee doesn't drain naturally. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay, yes. Yeah. That um, nutrients are factors influencing the appearance of algal See, you were taking notes, that's awesome. Yeah, we have to take notes. Yes. Better than like the horns of, of algae blooms. Okay, the algal blooms, there's not all of them, but some of them can be harmful, and what those impacts are. Yeah. And they're breathing it in. Yeah, you wouldn't think about that, but actually, like humans and animals, breathing it in can can have respiratory impacts. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I want to thank you all for having me here today. You want to thank. You.